Well, ladies, are you comfy? Yeah. Yes, very. Yeah, we yeah. unintentionally matched in our nearly match fully in our outfits. So. It's like a tricolour <laughs> sitting so here on stage. Yeah, that's <laughs> we arranged it beforehand, yeah. obviously, yes. Well, Rosemary, I'd say you felt like a complete badass back in the day in your car when we have young girls now scooting around on motorbikes. Would you give a motorbike a whirl? No. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. I think it's far too dangerous. No, I really do, because they've no protection around them at all. I mean, I asked the, the lovely little girl who was saying she was doing 180 miles an hour on a motorbike, and I said, well, do you have anything around your neck? Now, in the Formula One cars, of course, you have to have the neck brace, which I would have thought would be much more important riding a motorbike, because, uh, I mean, if you were to fall off, and I mean, I'm sure she's fallen off a few times, so she told me, around Mondello especially, she said she never gets around the first bend in Mondello if it's wet, because the bike always goes like this to run her. But she's persevering, and she's determined, and that's what I think. I mean, all youngsters who are doing anything, and nowadays, youngsters can do anything they want. I mean, they really can. And if they put their mind to it, you know, and if it's something they're really striving for, people won't put them down. I mean, when I started driving cars, whereas my father was always, he was very supportive, but other people would say, is she mad or something? Or where does she put, you know, and they'd, I'd be walking down Grafton Street with my mother and it would be, is she mad? You know, people coming towards me would be saying, because I tumbled down the sides of mountains in Monte Carlo and Africa, and because I travelled all over the world, uh, rallying and racing. But the thing was, there was no, none of the social media. There was none of anything like that. So nobody knew where I was, what I was doing, whether I was having crashes. And when I came back, I mean, I probably have as many gold, silver and bronze medals, except we didn't get things like that. We just got maybe a piece of tin thrown at us or, well, <laughs> not quite, but given to us. But we never got actually any um, big prizes and we certainly didn't get any prize money. I mean, unless now, you know, they're all talking about getting more women into all the various elements of sport. They can't get into motorsport unless they're from a very wealthy family or, and they won't get a sponsor unless they've gone out and won something. And if they haven't won anything, because they haven't had the money to start in the first place. So it's really, it's, a, it's very difficult for them. I'd love to see more girls doing it. I would absolutely love it, because there are so few. There are so few. Uh, in, you know, on the continent especially now, there are a lot of girls. I've been invited over to um, a, a race, and there's this new championship they're running just for girls. It's a uh, women's, uh, it's uh, like a formula race. It's a single-seater race, and there's no quarter given now, I can tell you. They are as good as the men any day. Then it was a, a championship put together. It was sponsored by a major company so that all the girls, they have the same cars, the same engines, and they go racing against each other. And they really, really, really do well. But for youngsters now, when I look at some of the young girls here, and I'm sure they think at some stage they'd like to try it. But unless you have money, you know, what are you going to do? You can go down to Mondello and you can take a car out and, you know, you can do a few laps in it. But even that, I mean, it costs money. So, yeah, it's another facet, though, that I think that it doesn't matter how rich or how poor or how much you have or how little you have. All elite athletes, you all have huge drive and you're all very competitive. And I was doing a bit of research before I spoke to you this evening. And I saw that even now, you still don't like people getting the hop on you. And I read a little article about uh, yourself and a certain Mr. Jeremy Clarkson and you trying to, you getting the better of him. <laughs> <laughs> still us in, let us know how you did it. Well, no, I, I, see, I'm an ambassador for Renault here in Ireland, and, which is brilliant, get a new car every few months. <laughs> 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 That's the best part of it. <laughs> but... Uh, I was at a dinner one night, it was one of the, uh, um, for the car of the year, this is about two years ago now, and I was sitting beside this gorgeous little French man, oh, he was, 
Now, I'm very old now, but I mean, I still have an eye for a good looking fella. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially with French people and he, these big doggy eyes, you know. Oh, you are so lovely, you know. <laughs> 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 flutter, flutter. So that was great. But anyway, he asked me what I did and so on. I said I raced uh, and I rallied. And uh, I rallied more than I raced, actually, because rallying is all over the world. You know, some of the events I did were 12,000 miles from London to Sydney in Australia. And then the other one was 17,000 miles from London to Mexico City. And they are day, night, day, night. It's not this thing if you drive about eight hours and then you go and you have a nice meal and you go to bed and you get up the next morning and you start. No way. 60 hours, 60 hours was one of the trips across Argentina from one side to the other. But we all did it, you know. But, um, no, uh, the I love that she got distracted by the beautiful French man and came off the story no, about no, Jeremy no. Clarkson. No, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'll tell you about Jeremy Clarkson now in a minute. No, 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 no. no. Anyway, <laughs> but this little French man, and he said, and what do you do, my dear? You know, and I said, well, I rally, I Monte Carlo rally, East African Safari, and I was going on and on and on. And he said, oh, and you drive in race cars? Oh, yes, I drive in race cars. I would be, you know, I could have said anything at that stage. He was, wasn't to know, as I thought. But it turned out he was the director of the sports division of Renault France or something. So about four weeks later, I, I got this uh, call from Renault Ireland here. And uh, this man, Paddy McGee, is the CEO. And he said, would you like to drive a Formula One car? And I said, oh, yeah, why not? I mean, I've tried most other things. And I said, that's fine. When is it? He said, in about four weeks' time. So the next thing I started getting, you know, reams of paper about what size and what, you know, how tall was I for the fireproof overalls and the neck brace and the helmet and the this and the that. And it was only when this started to come home to me that I really was going to drive a Formula One car. Oh, dear. So... I flew out to Marseille on the morning and a friend of mine came with me because she knew I was fine, but I was sort of getting a bit apprehensive at this stage. And uh, so we got out and we went, uh, flew into Marseille, then went up to the Paul Ricard circuit, it's the Grand Prix circuit. And it was only there that I realized that they, I mean, there were hundreds of people around and there were ambulances, and there were helicopters, and there were drones, and there were cameramen, and, and I said, what's going on here? I mean, who's doing what here? Oh, you're going to drive Formula One car. And I said, uh, yeah, but who else is going to? Oh, no, no, they're here for you. And I thought, oh, dear God. <laughs> so that was all right anyway, and uh, everything went fine, and I got into all the gear, and then they brought me around the track just to get... Uh, uh, you know, used to the track itself. There were lots of bends on it now. So that was that. Then I went out in what they called a uh, Renault Formula. It was just, you know, another single seater. And then the next day I was going and they put me into the uh, Formula One car. 800 brake horsepower. Now, for any of you that don't know what brake horsepower is, I'm not sure what it is either, but it's <laughs> bloody fast. <laughs> 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 I knew it was going to be uh, the minute I got into it. But now, back to Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was sitting in the car, and there are a few photographs taken, and, you know, the helmet was full face, and all, there, all you can see my big frightened eyes going, oh, <laughs> what am I doing next? But anyway, there was um, one of the mechanics was standing beside me, and one thing he said was, you see that red button down there? And I, you know, Ugh. No, and I put my hand out and he said, oh, don't touch that, because if you do, and if you, you know, he said, that's there because if you have a crash and the car bursts into flames, just pull that. That was very helpful, just before I went out. <laughs> it really was. But anyway, the next thing uh, this guy said, he said, now, don't worry, he said, Jeremy Clarkson stalled it and stalled it and stalled it before he could get it going. And I said, that lousy bastard. <laughs> 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 now, I worked with him once in London, and I just wouldn't work with him again. He's the most ignorant. <laughs> 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 I 
Of course, in the interest of objectivity, if he was here, he would probably disagree. But go on, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, he really wasn't very nice. Uh, no, he just because, you know, as far as he was concerned, this uh, one, you know, this old lady. <laughs> no, don't you laugh. You must be nearly as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, there's you know, a poor gentleman dying of shame here now in the front yeah. row. No, he's not. <laughs> no, it's lovely to see a, a few older people. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no. But you see, this is the thing. When I was in my fifties, I hated it. When I was in my sixties, I was sort of getting used to it. Then when I went into my seventies. I thought, this can't be bad. People say, and you know, they give you a seat where you go. If you go somewhere, <laughs> you, can, you can go anywhere you like now. And they say, oh, I saw you. You did that thing in the Formula One car. And now I'm in my 80s. I don't give a fiddlers about anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a good point to bring Jesse in because Jesse, as an elite athlete, albeit very recently retired officially, it must be kind of funny. Most of us retire as we get a little bit older, but for you to say you're retired and are you even 30 yet? Two weeks. There we go. Oh. So I knew it was in around this time. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> <laughs> so she's still only a baby and to be retired, it, it must be a strange feeling. I was just thinking when Rosemary was speaking there, I was like, can I just take that seat and listen to her? Why am I on this? <laughs> <laughs> how, am I gonna, how am I meant to follow these stories? But yeah, um, yeah, I suppose like that's the kind of the nature of sport. You retire at an age where you're not meant to be retired, but life got in the way. For me, I wish I could say that it was a decision that I really, really wanted, but one or two or three or four or 10 or 20 injuries later, yeah, I decided that it's time to kind of start looking at my next career. And, you know, you're still, I'm still very early in my next career, considering I'm nearly 30. You know, my CV is not as, you know, as, as big as it would be had I not been an elite athlete. And unfortunately, the skills only transfer so much to careers. But yeah, it was tough. I didn't see myself being 29 and calling myself a former athlete, but here I am. And that was just the way it happened for me. Yeah, it must be, you know, just for you guys who don't know here, Jessie is currently studying for a PhD in sports psychology. She nearly is Dr. Jessie. She's an accredited sport and exercise Brilliant. psychologist. So she knows Fantastic. what she's talking about. But yeah. still, <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely. But still, telling people or advising people is very different to them when you have to walk the walk yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? In the role that I'm in now, so I'm working with the Institute of Sport as a sports psychologist, and it is, it's brilliant, you know, and I've my experience, and I know that I'm, when I'm sitting in front of an athlete, knowing that if they sit there knowing that I've been there and I've done that, and everything that I'm saying, I probably have an empathy towards it, it does help, but I mean, I never saw a sports psychologist during my whole career, you know, which is strange to think that now I'm, I've become one, and now I'm trying to sit there and expect people to listen to what I have to say when I, I didn't think I needed one. But I, I realize now that, God, how much better could I have been if I had actually went to see someone like me? Um, you know, and I'm trying to practice what I preach now and the transition out of sport for anyone who is still involved is really, really tough. Um, you know, and you can do all the research in it. You can learn all the things from the books, but when you actually have to come and, s and face it and kind of face the reality of that identity not being there anymore. And, you know, I'm still introduced as Jesse the Hurdler or Thomas Barr's sister, um, <laughs> but you know, and it is, and now I'm just, you know, the first question that I was always asked was, oh, how's training or how's the injuries? Are you back running? And now it's just, how are you? You know, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, fine. It was, it was always the conversation started was how was training. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's great that I'm still involved in sport and I'm delighted, but when all the 20 by 20 campaign came out, I had such an urge to overturn that retirement decision because, you know, what an amazing time to be a female athlete. I know I'm still involved with sports, but I was like, God, I just want to be a female athlete in the thick of this now because it's such an amazing time to be one. And it would be the one thing if I was to go back, it would be because of all this is to be still involved and in the thick of it. But I am very lucky now to be on the other side and to be kind of involved from the management. Yeah, what support. do you think, because you did achieve a lot, I mean, don't don't sit here and belittle while you <laughs> achieved, you've done a lot, like you're at the Olympics and everything and you've, you've ha you still have some Irish records, I think, do, don't you, mm -hmm. or second best and that, still hold a second best time, there's a lot of stuff going on, but like, 
you never really, I suppose, fully retire, do you? Your your heart is always there. You're running along with people. I can't imagine you've thrown the runners into the cupboard. <laughs> no, no, I haven't thrown them in, but the spikes are definitely gathering dust. Um, I have a little dog, a little terrier. You've met Lily. I've met Lily. That's um, fine. She's so, so cute. So my little terrier, who's this tall, is my new training partner. Uh, I don't wear a sports watch. We just go out and we go running. Um, I've recently moved back to Waterford, but we were running down around the rivers in Limerick. And it was the first time that I really just enjoyed running for what it was. You know, it wasn't, I wasn't going out to time it. There wasn't a goal. The goal was to get Lily some exercise and to get me some exercise. And beyond that, I was like Forrest Gump. I'd go out and then I think, I'm tired now, I'll go home. <laughs> you know, there was no, there was no plan. I just kind of amble about until I was tired. I might sprint for a bit, I might jog for a bit. So I've actually loved running more now than I probably did over the last couple of years because now it's just for the pleasure and the benefits that it gets. Whereas when you're an athlete, you're, you're chasing goals and you're chasing right. times. And when your job mm -hmm. is to run, mm -hmm. it kind of sucks some of the joy out of it when you know, when there's pressure added. So, no, the spike, the shoes are still there. Um, I'm not getting the free stuff from New Balance anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> the soles are definitely a little bit more worn than they were. But, you know, that's that's part of it. Rosemary, do you time your drives to the post office still? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just, you know, I do something with cars all the time. I, I'm involved and I have the driving school for young people down near Nace. And... Uh, but you see, you know, earlier on, all the girls were talking about this thing of, you know, racing against girls, everything was... But, like, in our thing, and they were talking about jockettes and uh, jockeys and all this nonsense, you know. <laughs> and But in our time, we weren't, uh, you know, we were all drivers, and that was it. It didn't matter who we were or what we were. And from the very first day when we went out, the first international event I did and the competition manager said now remember you're all drivers I don't want an I'm a girl and I can't do such a he said I'm not interested in that you're drivers you go out to win and if you don't win or if you tumble the car down too many mountains you'll be sacked anyway so <laughs> was that manager was Ted Walsh by any chance <laughs> <laughs> Ted Walsh is a dose isn't he isn't he lovely <laughs> Ah, he is. He's lovely. <laughs> yeah. I know, they were all lovely. But, I mean, we didn't have uh, the thing of just, you know, racing against women. That was not the whole thing. And sometimes what I really got annoyed about, say I could be first or second overall, but then they'd say, ah, well, now you can only have one award, so we'll give you the ladies' award. Now, to win the ladies' award, you could be last. So then they'd give me that award, but they wouldn't give me the overall placings. And that really, really annoyed me. So that was difficult. And uh, I fought against that a lot of the time. But there were lots of things that, you know, wouldn't happen now that happened back then. Because, you know, everybody is entitled to do what they want. You know what I mean? And if somebody says, oh, mommy, I want to be a pop star. And mommy will say, certainly, darling, how can I help you? <laughs> you know, it wouldn't have been sort of horror. You a pop star. How can you possibly be a pop star? But all the time, initially, when I joined the teams, I had some of the other drivers on the team, the men drivers that me history had, saying, what's this dolly bird doing out here? And, you know, and I knew it very well. But the, the thing was that the company I drive, drove for initially was called the Roots Group. It's disbanded. Chrysler bought them over and it all went sort of haywire. But the cars weren't winning. And they knew very well that the cars weren't winning. So the competition manager, and though I never liked him, he was a slimy old git. But <laughs> besides that, he... Don't um, hold back. <laughs> Oh, that's what I say. No. But he really was, because, you know, if we went on a rally, he'd say, you're not going out with the team now for a meal tonight. Uh, you're going to have a, a meal with me in my room. This might be a good point, though, to point out that the likes of Jesse has benefited from trailblazers like Rosemary, and that now people are benefiting from things from that you've achieved, Jesse. Yeah, I think you're wonderful. Thank you. You are yeah, too. No, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, what kind of, 
I, I know we're talking about role models and it can be very, very easy to say, you know, oh, I love Sonia, I loved whoever, because we did and she mm -hmm. was amazing. But day to day, when you were growing up, what made that difference? What made sure that you got that to put on that green singlet and represent Ireland? Like, I know Sonia, even I did my interview out there and I said Sonia because, you know, she was the TV, that she was the day that she won that gold medal. It was the TV was rolled into the primary school class, which everyone knows was the best day ever. <laughs> and you know, you were cheering, and it was long before I ever started in athletics, but I suppose day to day, it was my mom and dad. You know, we lived in, you know, County Waterford. I had to be dropped to a bus. So if they didn't take the time out of their day every day to drive us to our different various sports, long before I was even doing athletics, I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't have done what I did because, you know, they were they were just amazing. They are still amazing. Um, they never put pressure on us. Like, they came to everything we watched. They drove across country. They sat in the car. My mum, I don't know how many cups of coffee she had every week, sitting in the car, reading the newspaper, drinking a cup of coffee while we trained. And, you know, they encouraged us to do everything, even if we wanted to do the tenth sport of the week, she would do it. We'd be brought everywhere. Um, there was times where both myself and Thomas wavered in athletics where we kind of thought is it time to call it a day and both of them, you know, support us, they want us to enjoy it. When it came to the time when I decided to retire, you know, the first thing she said is, are you sure? Are you sure you're not going to miss it? And I said, I will, I'll miss it. But, and she supported me through that. So I think, you know, I don't want to ever say just mum or just dad, but like it was mum, dad worked away. So it was mum who was driving us everywhere. And it really, truly, and you know, it's an easy one to say, but it's probably the most obvious. She really did drive us everywhere and she was number one fan always. It might be a cruel question to ask you, but because you've retired mm -hmm. and because Thomas is doing so well, waiting for that. I know, yeah, <laughs> and sibling rivalry, because we, we can be very mean to each other as siblings. I mean, me and my sister and my brother, we still fight like cats and dogs. I can only imagine if one of us was, you know, if we were all elite athletes, oh my God, I can only imagine the murdering that would go on in that house and we're just normal people. Yeah. So for yourselves... Growing up, you must have been competing amongst yourselves as well, amongst your peers. Obviously, he was a bit younger. And now he's still running and you're not. D is that bittersweet? Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, Thomas kind of copied everything I did, starting from the day he was born. <laughs> he was born on my birthday three years later. I couldn't even have my own day. <laughs> 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 um, so... From three years on, it was happy birthday, Jesse Thomas, you know, <laughs> and we're not twins. I had to share that and I hated it, you know, and he's still like, why are you so bitter about it? I'm like, you, I had my own day, but, uh, <laughs> you know, and it was, and it's, it's been amazing. And to have that support, we trained together all the way through only, f the only time we didn't was the couple of years that I, I was away in the UK, but we trained together all the way through. We were each other's number one supporters and it was great when I was ahead, you know, I, I kind of you know, as the trailblazer in the house and then he got good and then he got better and then he got really, really good and then he, everything that I did, he did better. <laughs> and that was tough. You know, anyone who has brothers or sisters will know that is a really tough and, you know, I was called up, like my first ever ma national TV appearance was, t I was called at two o'clock in the morning the night that he had qualified for the final or that he qualified through to the final in Rio. And Orti rang me and said, will you come up and watch, uh, or come up and be on the panel with my then hero, Sonia, and my other hero, Derville, and be on the panel to commentate on Thomas running in the Olympic final. And I, I took the chance, but I was like, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. And so I was crying on the TV, and part of those tears were for me, as selfish as it seems, because I, um, I was sitting at home from Rio injured, so it was tough. Um, I think that's you know, brave to admit, though. Yeah. That's really, yeah. yeah. No, and it's like... Easy. No, it's true. Um, and like as selfish as it seems, and again, to go back to my mom, I don't know how those couple of years where I was injured and Thomas was really, his star was rising. Like, I don't know how she managed it because it was always, poor Jesse, you okay? But Thomas is great, but Jesse, but Thomas. And I don't know how she did it, but like as time went on, I realized, wow, I, I, I don't think I would have ever achieved what Thomas did. It's still, like, and still I'm watching him being, like, God, I'd love to be there. And it was never an envy of him. It was never, I was never jealous of him. I was jealous of what he was doing. So I was like, all the things that he's getting to do, could that have been me had, you know, the cards fallen differently for me. But, you know, in terms of rivalry, yeah, there was always rivalry. And actually the m biggest rivalry was when we got older and we used to train together in the gym and we used to do counter movement jumps. I don't know if some of the athletes might recognize that. So it's just basically, it's a, a measure of power and you just jump straight up in the air. And there was a time where I was better than him. And this was when he was like going to the Olympics and I was still beating him. So 
even if he wasn't there. I used to take a picture to record, and if he wasn't there, I'd send it to him, <laughs> me and my coach. And because it was the only thing then I was able to beat him at. So the rivalry never really went away. But yeah, it is. It's tough to watch him, but like I'm still his number one fan. I mean, actually, the last time I was speaking to off the ball was last year when he had just won his bronze medal in Berlin. I was very, very hungover and they decided to ring me at eight <laughs> o'clock in the morning. I think that was my fault. I may have given them your number. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't even know where the phone was. We'd been out celebrating in the local Irish bar until five and then the call came through and I was puffy and I remember thinking, oh my God, of all times to ring me, but I've just become his personal PA and you know what? I love it. I'm happy to talk about him, but there is always that little pit in the bottom of my stomach wishing that that could have been me, but... Look, that's sport and it's it's a shame, but look, I'll never avoid the question of Thomas every interview until I, you know, until I'm <laughs> Rosemary's age, I'm probably going to be talking about him. But aren't I lucky that there was two of us that got to the, oh, the Olympics in one house? Uh, well, as well as that, not only that, but the amount, and let's not make little of it, just an emphasis again, you've achieved a lot and you're still achieving a lot. You, like, you nearly have a PhD in something that's really hard to get. Thank you. <laughs> like Thomas, I know it is. <laughs> Thomas doesn't have that. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not easy. I've been in my final year, my last year of it for three years, so it's <laughs> <laughs> don't do unless you have to. <laughs> uh, Rosemary, very briefly, because we're running out of time. Uh, from what I know of you, and I've been reading, I've heard about you for a long time. I've been reading about you. I never met you till this evening. What are you doing with yourself these days? What's the next big plan? Everything. <laughs> Seriously, everything I can do and I'm asked to do, I, I will do. Because, you know, there's no point. I'm not going to sort of sit down and start doing my knitting, except I can't knit anyway. But besides that, no, I can't. As long as I can keep going, I'll, I'll keep going. And it's always really something to do with cars in some way or other. Teaching, which I, I enjoy teaching the youngsters. But I'll tell you, the way things have changed over the last... When I started the driving school, which is 20 years ago, the youngsters used to come down from the schools, the, the transition years would come down to us and it would be, oh, uh, Miss Smith, blah, 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 blah. Then after a few years, it was Rosemary, blah, 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 blah. And now it's, hiya, Rosie, how are things? <laughs> you know, and I get invited to their birthday parties and their, <laughs> their graduate. And I say, you know, isn't this brilliant? I don't want to be. Yeah. The thing is, if you feel old when you're 30, and I know you don't, but if you do, no. you will be old, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But I, I'm so proud of the young people today. I think they are amazing. You included. Thanks. I'll, I'll let you in. <laughs> I'll let you there. But really, they are. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a pretty positive place to leave it at there, because like you said, this whole 20 by 20 thing, it's about keeping people inspired. doesn't matter, male, female, young, old. Just keep going, yeah. keep on trucking and yeah. do, do what makes you happy. Do what keeps you active and keep yourself at least young at heart. If not young in body, I think we're all going to struggle getting off the <laughs> stage. But it's a good place to leave it there. So I just have to thank yous now. So it's a big thank you to Gavin and IST from Three. They were a proud sponsor, of course, of the Irish Women's National Football Team and 20 by 20 for getting on board with this. They did a great job. To all our amazing guests, we had a wonderful evening, far too many to mention. To my co-host, the beautiful Nathan Murphy and Kleena Foley did such a great job. <laughs> One gentleman in particular who deserves a round of applause of his own is Kieran Bradley. He was a big part of making tonight happen from off the ball. To the Alex Hotel for giving us the place tonight. And to you, our beautiful audience. Gura Mila Mila Mahagi. <laughs> Sinead.